So you say in your book as well that political parties need to learn something from the Occupy movement and even from Al Qaeda. What, what exactly do you mean by that? What should they be taking from these? Just think about how effective Al Qaeda has been in recruiting young people and make them do horrible things. Uh, and, you know, I'm not suggesting that political parties have to become cults or have to transform their followers into suicidal murderers, not at all. What I'm saying is what, what's there? What do they have? What does Al-Qaeda have? that can be uh, at least uh, used uh, to provoke some new thinking about how to recruit and motivate and re energize and retain young leaders uh, and, and followers. That's, and the same happened uh, with the Occupy movement. You saw these uh, very large group of young people taking to the streets around the world. Uh, and, you know, in some places it had some consequences, in others it was just uh, an, an, an expression of anger and anxiety and disappointment about the situation. But the fact of the matter is that a lot of erstwhile apathetic and, and disinterested, uh, unpolitical individuals became highly politicized. And I think, you know, there's something there that political parties that want to be more competitive, want to attract and retain uh, uh, young leaders, young, young people, ought to learn from, from, from those examples. Uh, and, and again, it has to do with the fact that the last decade has been horrible for political parties around the world and very good for non-governmental organizations. How powerful do you think the position of U.S. president is today? Oh, there is no doubt that it's uh, very powerful. It is one of the most powerful places in the world and positions in the world. All I, I would say on the basis of uh, the research in the book is that it's less powerful than it used to be. Uh, there is a, a recent interview with President Obama uh, in which he explains that he was reading um, uh, the, the story of, I think it was President Reagan, that decided to build a pool uh, somewhere uh, in, the, in, the, in the White House, and that it, he could get it done. And President Obama reflected that, you know, how difficult would that become today, not just uh, with uh, the, the opposition and, 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 and other parties, but the scrutiny of the media and the commentary. It would become it would, it would become, I'm sorry, a, 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 an important national debate that will distract from other things. So that, I thought, was a powerful example of uh, how far more constrained this very powerful president uh, is. And all presidents are powerful, but I think that the range of uh, things that they can do on their own uh, is shrinking. And we hear a lot today about, um, you know, is China going to be the next superpower? Is it overtaking the United States? You point out that that's really not the type of conversation we should be having when we talk about power. What is it, though, that you see as fundamentally unhelpful about that way of thinking? You, that's what I call the, uh, the uh, what I call the elevator uh, approach to geopolitics. You know, who's up, who's down, and it also happens with companies. You know, just the rankings and the, there's a horse race, and uh, and and someone is up. You know, and and the fact, for example, if you center on that, uh, you lose sight of the fact that uh, China is a very poor country that has very, very l important problems and challenges that are very hard to tackle. You lose sight um, of the fact that uh, the power of the Chinese leadership is also constrained, more constrained now. If you just think about uh, the power that leaders like Mao had, uh, or some of the successors, uh, the people that the leadership in China that launched the massive opening of China, the economic reforms in China that uh, uh, brought China to, to, the, to the global economy. I don't know that the current leaders uh, uh, can have uh, uh, the same ambition because they know that they're far more constrained. Um, again, I'm not saying that the Chinese leader uh, and the Chinese leaders in general are not powerful. I'm just saying that they are less powerful. They can do less today than where the predecessors were able to do. Well, let's return to Al-Qaeda for a moment and the topic of the military um, and some of, the, some of the big changes that we're seeing in 
the way that wars are fought today. Um, you know, right now there's a conversation about cutting the defense budget, which is, you know, potentially a moment to take a look at the way that we as a country have thought about force and how we use it and how we invest in that power that we hold. What are you seeing as the way that war takes place now and what does, for a country like the United States that has relied on this big hierarchical institution that is the U.S. military for so long, what could it or should it look like five years from now, ten years from now? I have, uh, as you know, a whole chapter on the military and what's happening to military power. And I think it's, uh, uh, let's start with a small example. Uh, the, those are the pirates in, in, in Somalia, in, in the coasts, uh, in, in the Gulf of Aden in front of Somalia. They, these are people in rickety boats uh, with very, very primitive uh, uh, guns uh, and they go out and they hijack some of the largest ships in the world. And the world, uh, the international community, has reacted to that process, uh, that threat, by deploying the most, uh, uh, the largest and most influential armada. The, 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 in terms of uh, technology, is a very modern uh, fleet. And everyone is now uh, uh, patrolling those seas. And you have the Ukrainians and the European Union, the Chinese, the Japanese, the United States, the Russians, everyone is trying to stop the pirates. Uh, from from hijacking the ships, and they have not been able to do it. Uh, so that tells you uh, that that example shows you quite a bit. We're not even talking about uh, what has become common, which is the asymmetrical uh, wars in which you have uh, 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 groups, uh, and and one of the of the challengers is uh, far less, in theory, powerful that challenges in an asymmetrical way. Uh, the most powerful uh, army. It is an example of that, but an asymmetry, an asymmetric war is becoming far more common, but it's, it's a deeper example of, of how you have uh, um, a lot of wars that are no longer fought between armies, uh, formal armies that represent nation states, but you have different kind of combatants, different kinds of technologies, uh, and, 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 and have, are, are capable uh, of succeeding in what they are doing. They will never defeat those uh, big armies, but they can get away with doing what they want to do. And and they are constraining the options that the large armies have. And we saw that in Iraq and in Afghanistan with the use of uh, uh, improvised explosive devices uh, that uh, created, the, the, you know, are the largest source of uh, casualties for the United States uh, uh, military in, in those places and for coalition forces. Uh, and uh, the, the United States and others have uh, had to spend billions of dollars in trying to see how to contain, stop, uh, limit uh, the damage created by these uh, improvised devices. And uh, with still uh, some progress was made, but it was still not there. Another example, of course, is drones. Uh, both uh, the com our conversation in the United States is how, uh, you know, what are the rules and what is the, the, the legal frameworks for the use of drones. And while the United States is consumed in that debate, which I think is very important and very valid, drones are becoming popular and are becoming, you know, everyone can have their drone. Uh, you, you, you have built yourself uh, drones now, and a lot of armies, a lot of groups around the world, a lot of individuals ar around the world now are. Uh, you know, drones are now very inexpensive. So that again is an example of how military technology is becoming far more available uh, around the world, not only to militaries and to state uh, uh, sanctions groups, but also to uh, uh, terrorists, uh, uh, insurgents, uh, and other kinds of combatants. And, and one of those constraints for something like the U.S. military, right, is that they're, they're constrained, as you said, by rules, by rules of war, that there are now all these players emerging who don't sort of respect <laughs> or, or care about those rules of war, you know. Um, 
and that's part of the asymmetry. Also, you don't, you know, you only have, uh, you not only have the asymmetry in the types of uh, weapons and weapon systems you have, you also have asymmetry in terms of the legal frameworks by which you abide in order to conduct uh, uh, war.